If you're a beginner to intermediate player, there's gonna be a ton of helpful, actionable tips for you in this video. One of my goals as a teacher has always been to try and give people the stuff I wish I knew earlier on. Things that improve my ability to learn, understand music, and play the piano better. They're in no particular order, and there's a real mixture of topics. Mistakes to avoid, technical tips, practice advice, things you should be learning, and a few other random things that I find useful. So they're not really in an order, but I did specifically want to put this one first. The first tip is to have patience and don't expect shortcuts. Learning piano takes time and it takes commitment, both long-term with your overall ability and understanding, and sometimes with a specific thing that you're working on. You also keep building upon things that you've previously learned over time. Practice often to keep things fresh. It's a massive waste of time if you've just started to get the hang of something and then you leave it a week or two and come back to it and have to spend a bunch of time relearning just to get back to the same point you were already at. It gets frustrating too and it's demotivating to feel like you're going backwards. Little and often is usually better than big long sessions with massive gaps between them. Personally, I find that getting started is the hardest thing, but once you're in that habit and routine of practicing, it's much easier to keep going. Don't underestimate how important important technique is or neglect to work on it and isolate different elements of it. What technique does is it gives you the control with which to make the music sound much better. Try not to get frustrated with technique or expect things to happen straight away. Sometimes one little tweak can make a massive difference instantly, but often it's a habit that you have to work at till it becomes a habit. And it's also often lots of little different things that take time to come together until it all feels completely natural. Unless you've got a real acoustic piano, a keyboard or a digital piano with weighted keys is optimal for learning technique best. There's still a lot of stuff you can do without that if you don't have one at the moment, but you're best off if you can aim to get one as soon as you can. Full size 88 keys is the best too. Slightly smaller isn't too bad, but when you get to a certain point, you'll be limited because of that. I have a few suggestions down in the description you can check out, which some of my students used which I think are really good beginner digital piano options. The really common beginner mistake is to try and learn things that are way out of their league at the moment and it's completely counterproductive because you haven't got the technical facility to be able to pull it off yet. It can often sound a bit sloppy or unmusical and uncontrolled. You learn bad habits from doing that. In general, you're far better off and you'll learn to be a much better musician by gradually building up to things. But having said that, if you do want to improve, you have to find things that are going to challenge you in the right way and find that right level of difficulty to help you get better. If you're struggling with hand independence and fitting your hands together on something, here's a few tactics you can try. Sometimes one may work better than the others or sometimes you may need to try a few. Sometimes you need to just make sure that each hand separately is confident and controlled first. Make sure that you can intellectually understand where certain notes meet together and what beat number they land on. So if you're reading, you can visually see that where the notes line up. If you're not, you need to be counting and think, okay, these two notes land together on beat three or the end of one or whatever it is. So make sure the pattern is clearly in your head first before you try and technically pull it off. You can sometimes break down a pattern a bit more clearly by just focusing on which hand goes when. For example, together, left, right, together. And then the most important thing you can probably do is to piece it together bit by bit in chunks, only moving on to the next step when it's confident and gradually building it up slowly and then speeding it all up together once it's confident. You don't always have to do individual notes, whatever makes sense for whatever you're doing. Using minuet in G as an example, together and then together, right, right, and then together, right, right, together, and gradually add on the next thing when you're confident with what you've done so far. You don't actually have to say together, right, right, together when you're playing it, it's just so you can picture how it fits together. Make sure that you can hear the composite rhythm. So by that I mean the sound that the two hands create together, and then think of the hands as one. So if I was just to play this chord progression, my right hand's just playing evenly on the beat, but my left hand's not. But together they're going one, two, and three. Don't just exclusively learn to play songs and pieces of music. Obviously that's a really important thing to be doing and it's why we want to play in the first place. But there's a bunch of other stuff that you can do that will help make that aspect of learning to play much better. You need to be learning how music works, working on your technique, practicing your exercises, your scales and arpeggios, ear training, learning to read, all of that kind of stuff 
gives you more freedom at the piano and it makes the actual music that you want to play a lot more accessible and a lot more enjoyable and it makes it sound better. Don't just learn stuff, learn why you're learning it as well for a few reasons. One, it'll just help you give a better understanding of playing music, but it'll help you focus specifically on the things you're meant to be thinking about as you're doing it. If you're not really sure what you're meant to be getting out of something, then it's usually much harder to reach that goal. But also when you know what you can achieve when doing things, it's much more motivating to put the work in. I always try and explain that stuff in as much detail as I can on this channel, so that's why you should always pay attention to all the videos. Learning even some basic music theory will give you a vocabulary to be able to learn much more, much faster, and much more effectively. It becomes like learning new things in your own language as opposed to learning something in a foreign language. The best thing that you can do so that at some point music theory really starts to click and make sense and then becomes the most useful for you is to apply it to the keyboard as practically as you can. What I mean by that is don't just learn like definitions of things as they're written down or if you learn a new chord for example you learn the intervals that build it. Don't just see what that is like written down on paper. Actually find it on your instrument and see what those shapes look like in every key, how they feel under your fingers and more importantly how they sound and then try and look for moments in music where you can recognize when they're being used. One of the useful things about learning theory is so that we can label stuff so we can recognize it later. Remember your ears are so important as a musician so you need to train them. I'm going to be doing lots of ear training stuff on the channel this year. You need to be training things like intervals, how to hear chords, working out melodies and even just starting out being able to pitch a note accurately, singing it or humming it. Training your ears obviously helps you figure things out by ear, but beyond that, when combined with a bit of basic theory on how to label things, it helps you really understand music at a deeper level. It helps you find the sounds that are in your head if you're writing or improvising. It helps you recreate certain stylistic elements of a particular kind of music. But even if you're not playing by ear, it helps you memorize music because you're adding another sense to rely on. You can, for example, remember this part of the melody because it's the bit that leaps up a sixth. This is the part where we land on the five chord because I know what the five chord sounds like. But even before you learn anything as specific as that, with a bit of experience focusing on your ears, you can just hear the general shape and directions notes move around in. That reminds you what to play. This one's really important. You need to really listen to yourself playing. That may sound obvious, but a lot of beginners are so focused on the physical and the visual side of things, understandably, but they forget to listen and end up playing wrong rhythms, have the wrong feel, or even sometimes play the wrong notes because their ears are switched off. Your ears will give you the best feedback, so listen in as much detail as you can to everything that you play, down to the touch, the sound, the dynamics, and the length of every note. Just quickly, if you have any questions about any of these tips, please let me know in the comments. I've tried to go in as much depth as I can. Like I said, I will be getting a lot more in detail into all of this kind of stuff on the channel. Try not to be overwhelmed learning music. There is a lot of stuff to learn, and there's a lot of stuff in this video, for example, and it's good to get an overview of everything, but when you're actually learning, you need to take things step by step. Understanding music can be confusing, but eventually all the little pieces you learn start to fit together, and eventually you start to see the bigger picture. Learn manageable chunks. Don't overwhelm yourself with too many pieces or exercises or topics at one time. And more generally, learning piano can be frustrating at times. You forget things, things feel awkward, things don't make sense, you can't hear stuff properly, reading's really hard. So my tip is that you really need to embrace the learning process and try not to get annoyed because when you practice well, you'll start to realize that over time, things start to fall in place. Now I know it's hard to see this when you first start, but sometimes you just have to do stuff a million times until it clicks. And later on, you start to enjoy that process because you have confidence that it eventually works. So you're happy to sit there and do it. Don't practice till you get it right. Practice until you pretty much can't get it wrong. Once you've got something, repeat it and repeat it because that is what makes things feel completely natural mentally and technically. Learning how chords and scales and things are built is really important, but the long-term aim is actually to have that stuff completely internalized so you can recognize and find those things on the keyboard completely easily without having to think about it. That starts as well with just even being able to name the notes. This makes learning music way quicker because you start to chunk information and recognize these patterns and shapes. If you think 
think of music like a language, your aim then is to become as fluent as you can with all this kind of stuff. That does mean that you have to put the time and effort and dedication into making it fluent. Something most beginners are guilty of is practicing or playing too fast. For one, if you play above your speed limit, it sounds uncontrolled, the rhythm and timing goes, it sounds sloppy and unmusical. It's much better to play it a bit slower and have it sound nice. But if you're actually just trying to learn something, remember the notes and learn all the correct technique and get it to the point where it feels natural and build up those good habits. It's like a routine that you've got to get into and there's a lot to process mentally and physically and you just can't keep up with it when you go too fast. If something's not working, just slow it down so you can actually keep up with everything that's going on. And then once you start to get into a flow with it, then you can speed it up. So related to that, you should be spending some of your practice time using a metronome. This will help you develop your rhythm and your timing and your speed. Rhythm is such an important part of music and beginners will often rush making it sound a bit off. With more experience, you'll start to hear in much greater detail what a difference a good sense of timing and rhythm can have to music. It's also really important for you to start getting used to hearing something else whilst you're playing and locking into it. Learn all 12 of your major scales. They're the most important and most useful kind of scales to learn first. These are such a fundamental part of learning to play. They help you navigate the keyboard, understand music, learn to read and develop your technique. Learn all 12 of your minor scales as well and the different variations of minor scales. I'd start off with majors, but after you've done a few, you can kind of get them going together. And at some point along that line, when things come up, you wanna start learning some other kinds of scales as well. Maybe your pentatonic scales, blues scales, chromatic scales, and then eventually things like the modes of the major scale. Actually keep the root in mind when you're practicing scales. That may seem really obvious, but I have often seen beginners practicing a G major scale, for example, but then go on past the G to the next A. You need to keep that as a strong target. And that goes for other things too. Sometimes you need to keep track of the root of the key you're playing a piece of music in, or the root of the chord that you're on at the time, because thinking about notes individually out of context makes much less sense than when you can relate them to where they are in the scale or the chord that you're on. To picture all 12 major scales and actually see those shapes easily on the keyboard, don't think note by note. A bit of an improvement on this formula is to think in two separate blocks. Thinking in blocks and bigger shapes, chunking information is much better than step by step. It helps you think ahead and get your hand in position to move through the notes. The first block is the first three notes of the scale. A block of three notes, a whole step apart. Whole step, whole step. Then a half step above the end of that block, you create a block of four notes, a whole step apart. So now you've got D major. Just hit the D again at the top. I think this is a really useful tip and I have a whole video on how to do this properly and build up to seeing those blocks. Sometimes when you're practicing scales, your focus should be on your technique. So you might be working on your speed, on your touch, on your timing and everything. But other times your main focus wants to be on just where the notes are so you can get really familiar with recognizing those shapes easily on the keyboard. So here you might not want to play as fast as you can and really think more about being able to recognize these shapes quickly and switch from key to key. When you're playing two octave scales, we use G major as an example. Instead of remembering, oh, it's four here, then it's three, oh, what's next, it's four, and then it's three, just picture your hand in the position and the finger becomes obvious, you don't even have to remember it. What I mean is, when you start the scale, your hand is obviously in this position, five, four. Then when you get down to here, Picture what's coming up next. You've got a block of three and you know your aim is to get your thumb there. Well, that tells you finger three because you can just see that shape fitting into that shape. And then when you get to the second octave, instead of just remembering it like you would some random fact, picture your hand in the same position as when you started. And if you can just visualize your hand in that block again, it's finger four. So you're just coming at it from your thumb is the only thing and then you're turning into it there. Aim to learn all of your key signatures and recognize them by heart. You don't have to do them all at once. I think the best way is to do them as you learn a new scale. But importantly, don't let the key signature tell you how many sharps are in the scale. Let picturing the scale tell you how many sharps are in the key signature. So picturing A major, I can see there's three sharps. You can practice recognizing these on musictheory.net. Learn intervals really well, naming them, finding them on the keyboard, and hearing them. Intervals are our basic musical vocabulary we use to describe lots of other things. So learning particularly to name them and find them first is really important. Intervals are the different sized gaps between notes and they're so important because much of the character to the sound we make when we move from note to note or when we harmonize 
comes from the relationship between the notes, how far apart they are. They're a fundamental part of our musical vocabulary and almost like an alphabet we need first to then be able to describe lots of other things. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to start learning these at the beginning, particularly to name them and find them first because the shapes look different depending on where you start, so they need practice. When you learn different kinds of scales and chords, you end up learning them in all 12 keys, but don't just learn them as 12 separate things. Learn how they're built in terms of what intervals they're made of. Intervals are just like a selection of flavors or ingredients we can use. And when you really understand that and get better at seeing those shapes in different keys, you realize that the same kind of chord, for example, in different keys, which looks completely different on the keyboard to the untrained eye, is actually just the same thing. It's the same thing in a different range, just with a different starting point. And with practice, they begin to look the same to you as well. You begin to also see that different kinds of chords and scales are just different combinations of these intervals, those ingredients. Each one's a new recipe, if you like. It's best to start off with major chords and then minor chords because they're used most commonly and they're kind of like a foundation for learning other kinds of chords. Learning one formula that works in every key is essentially 12 times quicker than starting again each time. Use major chords and major scales as a framework to help you visualize the shapes and patterns for lots of other kinds of chords and scales easily in every key. Because there's 12 keys to learn every new type of chord and scale in, thinking of each one individually soon feels like memorizing hundreds of things, which is too much. But 12 major chords and 12 major scales is manageable. Then when you learn the intervals for something new, how to build it, you just adjust the major shape to help spot those new intervals. For example, with chords, from C major, you lower the third to create minor, back to C major, you raise the third to create C sus4. So it's a shape around the major chord. So in E, there's E major, lower the third, E minor, back to E major, raise the third, create E sus4. I have a more in-depth video on how to do this too, you can check out. Again, starting with major and minor chords and for the same reasons of recognizing shapes on the keyboard, you need to be comfortable with your chord inversion shapes. The tip is really to make sure that you can keep track of where the different notes are, as in where the root is, where the third is, and where the fifth is. They get used all the time in music, either broken up or played together, and you can use them as a framework for spotting and simplifying more complicated patterns, even when they may add on other notes around the chord tones as well. I'm gonna be starting to do a lot of stuff with these on the channel very soon. Once you start getting used to these, you need to start looking for them in music and beyond these shapes, so when the notes of a chord get broken up into different kinds of patterns. It will help you understand what's going on and memorize it. A really good example of this is in the first part of Feralese, where it literally just goes back between A minor, E, back to A minor. So we've got broken up notes of A minor here, and then we run through some notes of E, and then back to A minor. Now thinking of that as A, E, A, and then thinking what kind of shape am I doing whilst I'm on the A, what kind of shape am I doing whilst I'm on the E, is much easier than thinking of just loads of random individual notes that make it up. Learn broken chords and arpeggios as well. They really help with the other stuff we were talking about, recognizing all those shapes, but they really help develop your technique as well. When you start learning your staple exercises, your scales and broken chords and things like that, you need to keep them as a regular practice. To memorize the different kinds of minor scales, you just have to find the different combinations of sixes and sevens and get good at spotting those shapes in different keys. Notes one to five are all the same. I usually suggest learning your natural minor scales first and then you can adjust them to create the other ones, for example, raising the seventh for harmonic. This tip is just to throw yourself into the world of music. Get as much experience as you can. Experience playing, experience learning, listening, talking about music, watching documentaries, learning about musicians, musical history, going to see live music, watching what the musicians do, lots of active listening. So really listening to music and thinking about what's happening, sort of analyzing it in as much detail as you can at your current level. All that experience is just gonna give you a kind of learned intuition when you come to play music yourself. And there's lots of things you'll pick up and start doing it just because you kind of know what it sounds like. It's almost like a cultural thing, like if you're with a group of people, you just kind of pick up the way that they do things, the certain kinds of words that they use, the way that they talk, their accent that they use. You can kind of pick up that with music as well. And that experience can really just help you learn things more naturally. If any of these tips have been helpful so far for you, then please click the like button because that would be really 
really helpful for me. There's also plenty of ways to practice away from the piano, singing along to the radio, tapping rhythms, ear training apps and theory apps. Let me know what your favorite ways are below in the comments. Get in the mindset of discovery. The biggest thing that has ever driven me to learn more and get better at playing is hearing amazing sounds, hearing other musicians in all kinds of music and wondering how it was done. It, this is a big one, so analyze music. Pick apart sounds you like, a whole song or even just a melody or a phrase. Think about how it's put together, the scales used, the note choices, the harmony, the chord progressions, how the melody connects with the chords, the touch on the piano, the dynamics, everything. Even simple little things like noticing patterns or repetitions, Analyze it with as much vocabulary as you currently have and think about the how and the why certain things are done. This will help you think like a musician and speed up how much you can learn in the long run. Sometimes though, you just wanna be learning something where your primary focus is just physically how to play it and developing your technique. You don't always have to be analyzing how everything works in music at a beginner level. Often some things that you can play are probably a bit musically complex to understand at that stage. So I think it's important to learn a variety of things where you have different learning goals in mind. That being said, most of the time you still need to keep track of the basics like what key you're in and where in the scale you're playing stuff. And if you recognize chord shapes that you know to help you memorize it, that's still a really useful thing to do. To develop good technique, you really need to understand what one of the main goals of it is, and that is to play without excess tension. That's one of the things that's gonna allow you to be a lot more mobile, eventually develop speed, have a lot more control and musicality in your playing, and also to avoid potentially straining your wrists or fingers or something. Because your sitting height is really important at the piano, Generally, when your shoulders are relaxed, which they should be, and your forearm is straight, it wants to be just above the keys, so get an adjustable stool. Being at the wrong height can sometimes make things a lot harder and more awkward than they need to be. I've got a couple of suggestions linked down below in the description. Sit on the front half of your stool, have your legs shoulder width apart, feet firmly planted on the ground so you can lean into them when you move about and control the balance of your body. If your body's controlled, it's much easier to keep control of your arms and your hands and therefore the music. As well as being much better for your back, maintain a good piano posture. Sitting up straight, pulling yourself up from your core, not your shoulders. From here, when you're sitting up tall, you have a wider view as well, which helps you play things that are more spread out across the piano because you can see where you're going easier. It helps you control your arms and reach things much easier as well and really get on top of the keys. I say maintain because it's really common that people start out well and then gradually slump whilst playing. Generally speaking, unless you're doing something else specific, you wanna try and maintain a natural hand position and keep your wrist above the keys. If you just let your arm hang and relax down by your side, you have a natural hand position. Don't play with flat fingers or over curve them, there's no control like that. Don't let your wrist dip below the keys, it creates loads of tension and you lose mobility. Don't tip your hand up too far either as it's really awkward. A mistake people make is to start off well and then pull their fingers back as they're playing, so watch out for that. Be in complete control of and actually make proper use of your arms. I found this to be the root of many technical issues amongst beginners, causing them to be rigid and awkward when they move around and play. If you don't hold up the weight of your arms properly and use them to control the height of your hand, you can end up leaning on the keyboard, resting your weight, digging into the keyboard, pushing in too hard and sometimes dipping your wrist too like this, creating an awkward angle here. This kind of thing adds excess tension and really restricts your movement. When you need to move from that position, it's like trying to pull this fork out of the ground whilst also pushing on it with your foot. After a key is down, don't lean on it or keep pushing. Try doing this to get the feeling of controlling your arm weight. If you can just hover over the keys like this, touching them without actually pushing them down at all, then you wanna try and keep that feeling when you're playing. You're using all your arms and your shoulders and everything to help control this. Playing notes is not just about finger strength. Obviously, fingers play a part but it's more about directing the weight of your hand and your arm through your fingers, using them to control it. When you let the bigger muscles and gravity do more of the work and the movement, it leaves your fingers and your wrist and your hand feeling much looser and more mobile and you're able to flow through the notes much more smoothly. You're making small movements in your hand from note to note to get your weight on top of the next key. It depends on what you're playing of course, but it's things like movement up and down, forearm rotations and leaning into the notes. And when you move hand position, let's say you're playing chords, Use your arm to let your hand come up and release all the pressure, letting your hand and wrist relax. And like this, you're able to remold your hand shape easily for the next position. 
So in between chords for that little moment, you wanna recapture that feeling you had when you did this. Don't keep tense and static and rigid like this or try and move across or try and move fingers individually like that. You need to come up and over a bit so you can come down on the next position. You can think of your arm as kind of like a crane as well that you can use to place your hand in the best position to play things in the most easy and efficient way you can. When you're playing chords, hold your hand in a position where you can reach all of the notes comfortably. If you were to play a B flat major chord, that's these three notes. Obviously the black key is further that way. A common beginner mistake would be to put their fingers on these first two and then afterwards try and twist and reach the thumb round there. That's really awkward when you can bring your hand forward and keep your wrists more or less straight so you can get your fingers in line with all the notes. This way you can come down on the notes all together comfortably, which is what you should be doing. Everyone's hands are a little bit different, so you have to take the time to look for your own sweet spot. Don't overstretch to reach notes. If I was to play this, I'm gonna move my wrist over to that high note. A common beginner mistake would be to play the bottom two notes and then leave their arm really static and stationary and try and stretch the hand and the finger to reach the high one when you can just take your arm and move it over to where it needs to be. Start with your hand further forward like you're playing a chord so you don't have to reach as far, but still move with the direction of the notes. Another example would be the top of the G major scale. Sometimes people get to this bit and they've forgotten that there's a black note coming up so they hold their hand too far back and they're really they're just pulling their fingers away from where they need to be. But if you come into the position with your hand further forward, you can reach all those notes much more comfortably and avoid any jerky awkward movements. Sometimes you really need to think about your hand gliding over the keys a bit. Here my hand's moving the whole time and it's guiding the movement, it allows my wrist to move and control the notes and articulate the right notes I want and get the right feel. What you don't want to do is be twisting your wrist and using your finger to pull your hand over to the next bit. It's awkward and tense and you have no control over the notes like that, it won't have the right feel. Unless you're specifically working on your reading skills or improv or something, make sure you really take the time to memorize the notes and everything that's happening in a piece of music that you're learning. Because it's really hard to actually work on making it sound musical and your technique and everything if you're still stuttering over what the notes are. Sometimes it just needs a lot of repetition so you have to be prepared to put in that time to get there. If you can find a good teacher and having regular private lessons is an option for you, then you should really think about doing that and treat YouTube and learning online as a supplementary thing. If regular lessons isn't an option for you, then at least think about maybe saving up and getting the odd private lesson like once a month or once every couple of months because even that is really gonna help you out a lot. A teacher is gonna be able to adapt to your individual needs and in particularly notice things that you might be doing wrong with your technique that you need that feedback, you need someone to see what you're doing to be able to get that. If you're struggling to play a rhythm accurately and with a good feel, something you can do to help is to make sure you have it clear in your head first and vocalize it so you can process the rhythm in a kind of more natural way. If you speak a language or if you sing along to songs on the radio, then you're capable of getting to grips with far more complicated rhythms than you think you can because there's a lot of rhythm in our speech. If I was struggling to play this right hand phrase, for example, vocalize it first like this. To get it in my head and then follow that. Try to let your hand follow your voice and not overthink it too much. You can even go a step further sometimes if you need and put a sentence to the rhythm. You know when I went to the shops. Try counting whilst you play sometimes to improve your sense of rhythm and where everything is happening in relation to the beat. But at the very least, you always need to keep a good sense of where the one is. Up to a certain point when the music gets too fast or the division gets too small, it's really useful to count in the smallest division that you're using. So with minuet again, we're using eighth notes or quavers. So the notes of this are uneven because we've got longer notes and shorter notes. So counting all the eighth notes will give me an even grid to work against so I know where things fit. We're in three, four here, and then we'd vocalize quavers by saying one and two and three and. One and two and three and one and two and three and. If counting feels too hard to start with, try counting and tapping along to music that you're listening to. That's a useful method to ease your way into it and to train your sense of rhythm. So counting is a tool to help you practice, but obviously normally you wouldn't count when you're playing. But you always need to feel the beat, the pulse of the music and how what you're playing relates to it. Which notes you play connect with the beat and which notes go in between it. So playing the simple melody. <laughs> 
So I'm feeling which notes hit the beat. Dum, 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 dum. It's really important to stay locked into a constant pulse when you're playing. When you're playing, sometimes try tapping your foot or moving around a little bit. It's going to help you embody the rhythm and improve your timing and stay locked in to the music and the flow of it and the groove of it. Depending, it depends on what kind of style of music it is though, obviously. Play in front of other people as soon as you can, even if you're just like showing your friends or your family the thing that you've just learned. It's a strange thing to get used to and it just takes experience. And it's one of my biggest regrets not doing enough of that early on. Try and play music with other people as soon as you can. It's scary to start with, but once you start getting used to it, there is a lot that you can learn from doing that that you cannot learn by practicing on your own or in lessons. Sometimes you need to try and isolate specific skills to really learn them well. So that might be a technical thing, or it could be perhaps finding a particular kind of chord in every key. Make sure that when you're learning that thing, you're doing something that's only testing that at one time. Otherwise, all your concentration is going somewhere else and it's not being filtered directly into the specific thing that you're trying to learn. There's loads of different skills and sort of tactics that you use to read music, but the absolute backbone is being able to name individual notes really quickly. So when you're first starting, put in the time to get that really, really solid. I like to practice that two ways, being able to name the note out loud and being able to find it quickly on the keyboard. Eventually you wanna have that stuff feeling really fluent and natural. And you can use apps and things like musictheory.net to help you do that. The other main backbone of reading music is obviously rhythm. So in the spirit of isolating skills, you should also practice this separately. So you can do that by clapping rhythms or just playing on a single note. And it's often useful to do that before you try and read a piece of music properly is to go over the rhythm first. Record and film yourself playing. You don't need to show anyone, you just need to watch it back and analyze what you're doing. As much as you should be listening to yourself as you're playing, sometimes you will miss things. Go back and give yourself a constructive critique of what you're doing. See whether your timing's on point, whether you're playing the dynamics nicely, whether the touch sounds good, what the good things are that you want to keep included, where the weak points are you need to work on, and watching yourself back you might notice some technical issues that you need to work on. Keep your keyboard or your piano permanently set up. If you have to clear out a load of clutter or plug things in every time you want to start practicing you're far less likely to get started. If you're using a keyboard get yourself a solid stable stand because I know some people end up practicing on their lap or the floor or on their desk or something and relative to a keyboard, they're really inexpensive, so they're worth the investment. Get a decent pair of headphones so that you can practice whenever you like without annoying anyone else, because having limitations on your practice time is gonna hold you back. Obviously, that's for people who are using a keyboard. When you're practicing a song or a piece of music, don't always start from the beginning. For one, you'll end up practicing the first bit way more than the end of the song, so you'll be much less confident there. But also, you need to be good at coming in at different points. Sometimes people get it in their head, they can only play it if they start from the very beginning. So you want to get out of that habit. And similarly, stop just repeating the bit that you find the most fun or that you can do really well. What you need to do is you need to pinpoint the weak areas and work on them more until they're no longer the weak areas and everything, every part of it feels as confident as the rest. It's so important to always be thinking ahead whether you're reading or playing from memory or improvising. A really useful trick to memorize things easier and keep up mentally with what's happening in the music so you can think quick enough about what's happening next to get your hand in the correct position and not get muddled up with your fingers, which allows you to flow through the notes smoothly, is to think in blocks. This usually works best with hand positions. Now this does have implications for technique, which I'll come on to in the next tip. So a simple example would be this part of Furley's. So that's eight notes there going at this speed. But if I think of this as two blocks, then I only have to think as fast as the blocks change, not as fast as every note changes. And you can use recognition of chord shapes and things to help you with that. So this first block is basically an A minor first inversion, and then you go one note above it. And the second block is an E major shape, and then you go one note above that. Now I'm only thinking this fast. The next tip is to constantly keep moving and aim to get your center of gravity over each note that you're playing. So when you're using blocks like this, especially when they're a bit wider, you don't want to be too static when you're playing. So instead of keeping outstretched like this, which will generate lots of tension in your hand and far less control, you need to be moving through it. 
and getting your weight over the top of each finger, directing the weight through your finger to the key. So you're thinking in that block, but you're not statically getting your hand in that position. You're allowing yourself to flow through it. Get a proper style pedal and not one like this. Watch out though, because not every band is compatible with every keyboard. The best budget option that's also universal I've come across from a reputable brand is the M Audio SP2 pedal. Again, there's a link down below. I have a whole in-depth video on how to approach fingering on the piano, but a quick tip here is to think about it a bit like a puzzle and work backwards sometimes. So if I was to play this, to reach up to that note, I'm gonna need my fifth finger and I'm gonna need to leap up from my thumb. So for my thumb to be on that C, these other fingers just fall into place here to lead me there. And try and think about the shape of a block of notes and just imagine your hand fitting into it. So if I was to play this, my hand shape just fits into that block like that. This might work as well. And doing that helps you think ahead a bit so you don't accidentally start off and realize you've got no fingers left to reach the next note. As a beginner, most of the time when you're practicing, you wanna be making sure that you're repeating the same finger numbers and paying attention that you're actually doing that. If you don't, it's really hard to build up that muscle memory and learn stuff by heart because it's like you're practicing it different ways each time. But having said that, sometimes you might wanna try different kinds of finger techniques, maybe something that you're less comfortable with that feels a bit weird to start with because eventually it will just make you become a more versatile player because that will feel as comfortable as the thing you can already do. Don't unnecessarily squish your fingers when you're playing chords. It can get really awkward. Let's say you're gonna play this E minor chord here. Often I see people doing things like this. They might play one and two here and then the natural option would then be four because then you've got one finger over the one spare note here. But um, people often might do like five and then you've got two fingers all squished up over this one note and you can see how my hands all bunched up like this. So you don't wanna do something like that unless there's a specific reason. You might try and practice thumb turns completely on their own to get comfortable with them for scales and applying them to actual music too. Beginners will quite often twist their wrist round awkwardly or try and force their thumb under too hard and too far. Practicing them on their own is a really good way to get comfortable with them because it needs to be one smooth, relaxed motion. It needs its own video to do that and I'll be putting one up really soon. Try and be a fearless learner and don't be embarrassed about sounding bad. Literally the worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna hit a wrong note and that's it. I get this a lot more with adults because it's weird for them starting from nothing at a later age. Kids are just more used to that. But every musician knows exactly where you are because they've been there themselves and they know how much work they put in to get where they are now. Being embarrassed and being scared to learn stuff means you just play cautiously and it just holds you back. This tip is whatever kind of music you're most into, if you're particularly into classical music, Learn some basic chord music as well, even just like simple pop accompaniments. When you're just plonking chords together, so a typical kind of scenario for playing chord accompaniments is to have a chord position in your right hand and then like a root note and maybe roots and fifths and things in your left hand. Often when we're gonna start playing things where notes are broken up all the time, where sometimes you use the notes in between the chord tones as well, it's really easy to completely lose track of where those notes have come from. This gets you really confident with the keyboard layout and chord shapes and all the inversions, all the different places you can play those chords and the chord progressions. Learning these theoretically and practically but in exercises will only take you so far. To fully get to grips with this kind of thing and have it internalized, you need to feel them in action as you're playing real music. Familiarize yourself with a basic musical vocabulary. It will help you learn much more efficiently as you'll hear these words banded about all the time. If you hear a new word and you're not sure what it means, just take the time to look it up and learn something new because all that information is really easily accessible. Speaking of looking things up, if you're having trouble with something, maybe a technical thing or a concept in music, don't just sit there stuck. Seek some advice and research some actionable steps to solve your problem. Obviously YouTube and Google are really good places to look, but sometimes you can't find the answer you're looking for or your question's too specific. A really good place to look is Reddit. The piano forums on there, there's often uh, really experienced players who are willing to help you out and answer your questions. This one's really handy. When you're understanding any kind of theory concept, how a chord is built, how a scale is built, chord progressions, all that kind of stuff, understand it first in the key of C, or if it gets confusing in another key, bring it back to clear it up in the key of C. When you're in the key of C, the C major scale, all the white notes, forms a nice straight line, and these are all the major and the perfect intervals. 
and everything that goes out the major scale is all the black notes. And all the black notes are the minor intervals and the tritone, which has got a bunch of names. It's much visually easier to see which intervals are being used, which interval you've started a chord from, which intervals you've used in a chord or a scale. When you go around other keys, all the shapes change, but if you get that clarity in the key of C first, it's much easier to do those more complicated things afterwards. I think one of the biggest challenges of learning piano, apart from the obvious technique issues, is that the shapes keep changing in different keys. And that is very visually confusing. Apart from practicing chords and scales in different keys, which you should be doing anyway, you should specifically practice transposing different melodies and chord patterns or even entire arrangements through all 12 keys. Or to start with in keys that you're familiar with. Working at this makes music much clearer to understand and you get so much more familiar with the keyboard. I'm going to be doing lots of guided practice sessions on this this year as well. When you're practicing something in all keys, make sure that you do it in an organized way. So there's a few ways you can do it. You can just go up in half steps. You could do all the white notes then the black notes. A lot of people like to use the circle circle of fifths or go around that backwards and it becomes the circle of fourths. If you're only learning to read and everything you do involves sheet music, you're missing out on a lot of stuff. If you're only learning to play by ear, there's a lot of value in learning the basics of reading music. Not necessarily sight reading to a high level, but just at least being able to figure out stuff from sheet music. If you really don't want to learn sheet music, I still really recommend learning at least how to read rhythm for two reasons. One, because all the terminology is not just applicable to reading music. We use that as musicians anyway, so you need to know that stuff, but also, Learning to read rhythm will help you understand how rhythm works and visualizing that on a piece of paper is gonna help make that much clearer in your head eventually. Listen to and learn music outside of the main style that you're into. You'll be surprised what you can learn from other things and how you can apply it to the thing that you really wanna do the most. If you're having a longer practice session, make sure to take short breaks as well. And if something's getting stressful, you're not getting it, leave it, do something else, or come back to it. Sometimes just coming back to it the next day, it can suddenly feel easier. Not always, but sometimes that helps. And if you do the same thing for too long, you, it can start sounding good and then start sounding bad again. It can get a bit blurry, and it's best just to leave it and then come back to it another time. Make sure that as well as all your proper focused piano practice, you're also carving out some time for fun things and experimentation. You've still got to enjoy learning music along the way and you'll also discover a lot of stuff doing that as well. Practice saying the alphabet backwards from G because obviously playing music we need to go both ways. Start trying to work out simple melodies by ear. And when I say simple, I mean even things like nursery rhymes and stuff like that, obviously they're a bit boring to do but they're really familiar with most people, so they're really useful for that. Over time, you'll learn systems and start recognizing things in music and ways of doing this easier. I'll be putting out loads of content this year to help you learn how to do this, but one important tip to get going is to try and do it one, two, or maybe three notes at a time. Don't try and do long chunks of the melody. When you're figuring stuff out by ear, try and get the key that you're working in. Let's say you figure out that the key is G major. Well, you instantly now know that this is your selection of notes to work from, and that unless it goes out the scale, which you should learn to try and hear whether things kind of sound like they're saying in a scale, then you know to look in this area and not to bother looking at those notes that aren't in the scale, unless you particularly hear it go out and use one of the other colors. Try not to practice aimlessly or get distracted when you play. Have specific learning goals in mind for that session or that week or that month and then stick to them. I don't mean things like, oh, I'm gonna be this good by this date. I mean goals more like to get a certain amount done to spend a certain amount of time on specific things. And then when you're practicing, don't get distracted by noodling around or just playing some random things or just things that you enjoy playing. Obviously you've got to do that stuff as well, but set time aside to do that other stuff. Have your main focus practice and then set specific time aside for anything else that you want to do. It's just going to make the best use of your time. This next tip is one of the most important things in the video and I can pinpoint this as the thing that skyrocketed my own musicianship and ability to learn when I started applying it properly. You need to think a bit less about individual notes and more about numbers and intervals and patterns. Doing this really gives you a toolkit to start analyzing music, making sense of how it works and speaking the language. It helps you know where you are on the keyboard and where the notes have come from. It gives you a terminology with which to learn other things, for example, how to explain how to create a certain sound 
for a particular kind of music, helps you memorize music, not get lost when you play, helps your ear training, reading, improvisation, and loads more. I can't cover this in as much detail as I'd like in this video. It's the kind of thing that needs a slower, more in-depth explanation with examples to grasp fully. So I'll be putting a whole video together dedicated to this topic. I really recommend watching that when it's up. This is the bullet points of the idea. Essentially, pretty much anything you do in one key, you can do in another. The same melodies, chord progressions, patterns, anything. But the notes and the shapes will be different each time. But when you use numbers, it becomes clear that it's really the same thing. It takes time to get used to this because in different keys, the shapes are visually confusing to start with. And it's best to start out with major keys, for example, with less flats or sharps like C, G, F, and D. The clearest thing to do first is to number the notes of a major scale. Then we can describe a melody or anything else that's happening in music in terms of which numbers of the scale it's using. So we're referencing the root of the key as our starting point in our example, C. So in the key of C, O when the Saints uses one, three, four, five. So if I played the first, third, fourth, and fifth notes of the F major scale, it sounds like the same thing. These are intervals in the scale we're using, but if we know we're in a major scale, we know what the intervals already are. We don't have to say the full name all the time. We just say third instead of major third. But if we use a note outside of the scale, for example, we tend to specify it. So if I'm gonna use E flat, it's the note flat below the third, so we'd call it the flat three or the flat third. And using that again, we then need to number the chord. So the chord that starts from the root is chord one. The chord that starts from the second note of the scale is chord two. And if I then play the same chord progression, maybe a two, five, one in different keys, it's going to sound like the same movement, the same pattern. Similarly, if we started a chord on a note that wasn't in the scale, like the flat third, we'd say the flat three chord, and then we say the type of chord after. So that's one level. We're describing things in relation to the tonic or the root of the key that we're in. But then on another level, when it's suitable for the music you're playing, you need to be thinking about the notes related to the chord you're on at the time. So if we're in the key of C major, but at a certain point we're on an F major chord, we also need to think of the F as one. So now when we think of the root of the chord as number one, we can describe patterns we're doing on the chord with the chord tones or with the notes surrounding the chord tones, which we sometimes use for extra color and things. So I might be doing some kind of pattern on the chord which involves the major second. Then when you do the same pattern on another chord, you just use the second of that chord. Most importantly, to do it with major scales first, you need to learn the diatonic chords of the key. That just means the chords that come from the notes in the scale. We number the chords, so the chord that starts from the second note of the scale is chord two, the chord that starts from the third note of the scale is chord three, and we use Roman numerals for those numbers. In every major key, naturally, one, four, and five are major chords, two, three, and six are minor, and seven is diminished. This is the same for every major scale. We get these chords by playing every other note in the scale until we have three notes. Of course, you can also create other types of chords that still stick inside the key too, and you can add on extra notes, but this is the sequence that you should learn first. So you need to start working towards being able to find these chords easily in every key. As you learn to play a new major scale, do this as well. Listen a lot and really carefully to music you're trying to learn for a few reasons. One, so you can hear how professional performances of it sound, so you can hear all the nuance, but also because it just helps you memorize the whole thing, the structure and everything. This is usually best with headphones or a decent pair of speakers. Try and be creative and actually start writing music. Even just simple little melodies and things to begin with. It might not be very good when you're first doing it, but it really doesn't matter because what you're doing is you're starting to learn to think musically and make creative musical decisions. You should start trying to improvise too. That may be improvising with melodies and like, you know, taking a solo kind of improvisation, but also with chord progressions or just like patterns whilst you're on a chord, all that kind of stuff. Again, it might not always sound good when you first start, but you'll start thinking like a musician and hearing things differently when you do this. And a great way to start is to just slightly adapt something that you can already do. So if you're playing a little chord pattern, just do a very slightly different rhythm or try it with a couple of different notes. Experimentation and exploration is a really good way to learn on top of the more kind of formal stuff. Pay close attention to your technique when you're playing. This is particularly important if you don't have a teacher, but also if you do and they're not there. Let's say for example, there's a particular part that you're learning and you're meant to use finger four, but you keep accidentally using finger three. 
for a few goes, you really concentrate on that finger four, but then after that, you start thinking about something else. And then for ages, you've started using finger three again, and you haven't realized. You've got to get really sharp at noticing that kind of stuff. Make use of dead time. This is really great for a particular little passage or a particular section of something that you're working on. So if you've got a couple of minutes free that you're not doing anything else with, you're waiting for the kettle to boil, or just before you leave the house for work or something, if you can do that multiple times a day, you're getting that repetition in and you're keeping it fresh in your mind. So when you come to a proper practice session, you're ready to go. I like to broadly categorize learning to read in three different ways. One is sight reading, where you're doing it or aiming to do it for the very first time of seeing it. So that's gonna be at one level, usually starting off with very simple things, uh, single right hand parts, single left hand parts before you can do that two parts at the same time. Then the next one would be at a level where you can kind of play it and read it at the same time, but you sort of already know it, you're kind of like skim reading it and using it as a guide. And then the next level would be something that's way too complicated for you to, at the moment, be able to read it and play it straight away, but you can intellectually figure it out from the sheet music and learn how to play it and memorize it from that. And I like to do that because then you're focusing on different skills. You don't wanna be stuck just playing simple, silly little melodies that is your actual music practice, That just because that's all you can read and process at the same time. It doesn't make any sense to do that. When you try and sight read, you need to not look at what you're doing and you need to keep your eyes on the score, mainly because it's just really easy to lose your space if you look down and then back up. You can sometimes get away with not tilting your head, but just kind of a little glance down it's like, well, peripheral vision, but downwards, whatever that's called. The looking down without tilting your head is a tip I learned from Bark Scholar's channel. When you're reading music, you wanna try and be looking ahead a little bit. Now, it's hard to say how far, depending on what the music is. And you also wanna try and chunk information. You wanna see groups of notes together. You wanna to try and spot patterns. You wanna try and recognize chords and things like that. When you start to do that, this is gonna help you keep up with a lot more information a lot more quickly, but it does take a lot of practice. Practice playing things without looking to help develop your spatial awareness on the keyboard. And when you do it, visualize the keyboard in your mind. It's obviously gonna help you when you're sight reading, but there's other situations where you can't see if your hands are too far apart, or if you're playing in a band, you need to be looking at other things that are going on. But it's also gonna help you when you can look because you're relying on your sense of feel as well as your visual sense. Watch other musicians in videos and really pay attention to what they're doing. You can pick up a lot of things that way. So even just technique things like how they're moving their arms and everything, um, but also sometimes you can associate the movement with the sounds that they're making, which is really helpful for your ears. To learn to recognize intervals in the beginning, you can use famous melodies as it's easier to attach the sound of something to something you're already familiar with. For example, a perfect fourth is the beginning of Here Comes the Bride. Especially if you're learning on your own, but even when you're not, when you're practicing on your own, you need to develop a really high attention to detail. Really concentrate on everything that you're doing, making sure that you're applying all the technique stuff that you've learned, that you're sounding how you should. If you've been given a tip by a teacher or something, make sure that you actually stick to it. It's quite often that someone will tell you, oh, try it like this, and you go, oh yeah, that works, and then you'll do it for a few times and then sort of forget about it. So make sure that you're really diligent in applying all the things that you're working on and you're, that you're noticing that you're doing them. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Remember, I'll be going into a lot more depth into a lot of these topics in past videos and in future videos on this channel. So if you want lots more things to help you learn better, then you can subscribe to Piano From Scratch.